Yeah. Yeah. Welcome to this afternoon. Um, I'm going to talk about agent-based multicellular models. Um, yeah. Firstly, good. my name is Tim Yuen. I'm a member of the group of Jake Dresser, the multicellular systems biology, which is a binary <coughs> based partly in uh, in Paris. Uh, in India, uh, Jeff Grasso is uh, has his group, well, uh, here, uh, is here, um, is coming from, and partly uh, is based in Leipzig, where I'm working with, uh, under Stefan Himmel, who's a poster, who mainly um, make the software we are using to simulate our models with. Um, so firstly, what we do is, as the title says, multicellular uh, systems. We model them in an agent or individual-based uh, way. Uh, it's lattice so most, most mm -hmm. agent-based models I know are actually on a, on a lattice, and um, we're not doing that. And of course, we're doing simulations. Without that, the model is not useful. We, we use those models to predict or to, to show if uh, our model uh, does capture um, the nature of the system. So what exactly uh, do we do? Uh, I said multicellular systems. Now, uh, the German part of the group is funded uh, to a great deal by the virtual liver network project, which is um, uh, looking at the liver, you may might not recognize this. This is the mouse liver. So um, the liver is one of the most important organs in any um, vertebra, vertebrae. Uh, great. Um, it has a lot of, of functions like detoxifying uh, the, the bloodstream coming from the, from the intestinal uh, system. It produces a lot of proteins necessary for the whole body to function. Um, it is involved in, in lipid and in, in glucose metabolism. Um, and it has the great um, um, the ability to regenerate from action of up to uh, three, uh, three quarters of its mass. So it regenerates the whole it can regenerate to the whole um, liver after cutoff, um, which no inner organ can do, actually. So the skin can do it, but the organ but <laughs> That's why I said inner. So um, I said it can detoxify um, the blood. Now, detoxification is, is like a filter uh, problem. And a filter, as you know, uh, needs a lot of surface and what evolution did to the liver is um, to, to solve this problem is uh, making it composed of very many of the same functional units which are in general like like honeycomb structures within uh, the, the whole organ which are packed together in a dense way um, so this is a scheme of uh, one of those units called the lobby. So you have the lobe and, and the uh, functional, functional subunit of your. Um, you see here, here, this is the central vein which uh, transports off um, uh, blood from the liver. In the corners, you see uh, the and uh, the so-called portal veins to transport the uh, bloodstream from the intestines to the liver. And um, then in between those uh, two veins, there is uh, a capillary system, a network of capillaries, which we can see better in, the, in our models. Um, already, our, our models look like in a visualization. Uh, so you have a capillary structure that transports or uh, that, um, that, 
lets uh, the blood stream from the portal vein to the central vein. And on its way, it um, it touches those uh, hepatocytes, the main uh, cell, uh, the kind of cell in the liver functioning, uh, detoxifying uh, cell in the liver. So these capillary stressors are called the, the sinusoids, and the bloodstream goes from here to the central vein. So, um, so uh, this is just a snapshot of how it looks like, the, the structure. But we want, of course, uh, to, to simulate that. And as an example, um, we have a situation like this. This is an um, intoxication of the liver. There was uh, a toxin um, injected into the central vein. It gets transported to the, the lobules. And uh, from the central vein, the, the toxin diffuses into the, into the tissue and kills off um, the cells that get a certain level of this toxin. And after a while, um, you see at the beginning, uh, those cells just slide inside, but they also multiply from a certain point on. Um, partly just because the pressure uh, is taken away from the cells and they uh, come out of the dormant state, partly because um, we also simulated the, um, the diffusion of a human growth factor from the central veins. I mean, how do you have it affected the blood when the central vein is taking it away from the you, you put it into the central vein. Uh, yes. Yeah, the, the uh, simulations are according to a problem that um, experimentalists did. So they they injected CCL4 right. uh, into the central vein. And they overcome the flow. Yes. And CCL4 still reaches the Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Hmm. The central vein uh, uh, is actually also uh, the name of a bigger structure. Um, that's, that goes out of the out of the liver as such. So um, when I say central vein, I can use it in two ways. Um, so you, you see, we are dealing with a lot of, of those cells, and uh, we're interested in uh, its movements in the regeneration process uh, in uh, self. Uh, organization of those cells uh, within the liver and um, of course the cell is a very uh, very complicated contraction um, and we are just not interested in where the nucleus is uh, in this model we are not interested in what exactly goes on there are lots of, of, of metabolic networks uh, so we, we have to abstract that to get an efficient uh, model. And we just say the surface is the, the boundary. And everything that happens in the, within the cell, uh, we just pick uh, models from uh, what other people already uh, did, like metabolic network uh, models. And uh, we use this kind of abstraction. So in our model, in principle, we have cells, and we have extra structure. And this structure is actually in nature also composed of cells. Normally, those sinusoids uh, have epithelial uh, cells. And there's also uh, different cells that we're just not looking at. Um, so we have, in principle, some structure and cells that we want to, to look at. Yes, please. Uh, the, the structure of the network is um, from image analysis. We analyze, we have uh, stacks of, of uh, same uh, um, uh, what was it, deep field uh, or at the end of uh, the and um, But we analyze the network first and then construct it, reconstruct it from the, the um, statistical 
um, distribution of the, the, the um, hopping <coughs> bifurcation and the mid medium lens and so on. So when we are on that level of abstraction, now I come to agent-based model. Um, what can a cell do? Um, a cell normally grows to a certain size. It will then at some point divide. Um, they can collide. It will not look like that. They can. They, there is a, a kind of adhesion between cells only, and of course a kind of, of uh, repulsion uh, that has to go into the model. And then there is, uh, of course, still signaling. And as I said, if we look at the the inner workings of the cell, we use that we abstract it to a state, an inner state, and, and use state transitions uh, to to go from one time point to the other to go through something called the cell cycle. So in this kind of, of model, we have, um, in general, objects. We have uh, that was this uh, network that we, the sinusoidal network, that we were looking at, and we have special objects called cell. They interact with each other. Cells interact with other cells. Objects may uh, interact with other objects, and both of these kinds of objects interact with the environment, which is which can be seen as another kind of object. But um, we live with like the environment. Uh, what does it mean in our uh, case? So cells uh, specifically have a, a, a life cycle. Um, they grow to a certain size and then they, they divide. Uh, but they can be stopped in their development uh, by certain outer conditions and they can be uh, the, the cell cycle, uh, the speed of the cell cycle uh, can be enhanced by uh, chemical signaling with growth factors. It can, on the other hand, also be inhibited by inhibitors. And uh, it can be inhibited by pressure, too. So if the cell much pressure from outside uh, other cells, it will be in a dormant uh, state. So here uh, is this cell cycle scheme, which you will learn in biology very early on. And um, so to model cellular, multicellular processes, we have to, to implement something like that. Or we have to describe an inner state, a state transition, and the influence on these state transitions. Uh, on the other hand, we need in our model uh, mechanics, physics to describe what happens when they uh, mechanically, physically interact with each other. So uh, in this case, we have um, an approximation of uh, what kind of, of surface overlap the uh, real cells would have if we model them with uh, spherical um, shape. Uh, we don't have to look at the uh, at the formula there, it's too complicated, I think. Um, so, um, if we talk about now a specification language, what is the goal? What do we, as, as in our group, want from this? So, there's one, of course, we have to describe the model as such, what, what constituents are in there, um, what kind of cells, what kind of other objects uh, are there. Uh, we have to document that to, to tell others what we're doing. They might not have uh, our, our software tool uh, with, with which we all also want to execute simulations on, it, on those models. Uh, we also want to have some snapshots of our simulations, some like, like uh, a state from which we also can, uh, for instance, go on simulating. Uh, and, of course, we want to have something for the reproduction of the simulation. Then, uh, 
for the last point here, for the reproduction of simulation results, we need uh, a very um, a complete description of the model because when we leave out something else which we implicitly put in the model or somebody else is actually adding to the model, um, and we are not taking care of that we're not using that, for instance, we will get different results. Then uh, it's the same thing with uh, model comparison and uh, yeah, comparison of results from other groups with other software. Um, in our models, we have different scales, different of descriptions, which um, are partially captured by uh, description languages developed by the API. So uh, the intracellular signal pathway and metabolism uh, can be captured with cellum L, uh, the uh, diffusion of signaling factor by guess can be modeled with uh, field and L um, or open uh, CMIS that is um, the uh, flows through vessels, on the other hand, uh, can, I don't know, can be probably also captured by a field ML and uh, the structures, of course. Um, in between, uh, we have this uh, inherent thing, which I already told you what we need to, to for agent-based modeling in general, that we have an inner state each individual uh, thing has an inner state on uh, which grounds it, it reacts in a different way. Um, we, need, we need to have some duplication mechanism described. So what happens if one cell divides into two cells? What, uh, uh, yeah, what things get transferred to, to the daughter cells? What are random? What, uh, cannot be described by, by the uh, precursor. Um, and then, of course, cell mechanics has to be, uh, to be done in our case. For general uh, agent-based models, that's interactions between, between uh, different agents and uh, the cell-cell interface belongs also to this kind of general uh, interaction. Um, so the gap, we, we have, as I stated, we have to first uh, introduce the concept of an agent into such a description or specification language. Um, the inner state, state change, uh, okay, no, I, I actually said that already, and yeah, for that, I, I would think that we need a, a higher level uh, description language which utilizes uh, TeleML and FieldML as they already capture parts of the whole thing. Um, we, we need to have this uh, state, uh, the inner state, uh, we have to have the state transition and so on. Um, so um, for our case, we, our group, needs to have uh, some some description how a um, outer influence triggers a state change, like pressure, like chemicals, like, like growth factors or inhibitors. Um, I don't know how, so uh, that's probably uh, only done uh, during the discussions. Um, yeah, and the daughter cells, how, what, uh, will be copied and so on. When do <coughs> cells interact with each other? For instance, what, if they only uh, interact when they touch each other? If, for instance, I, if I think of, of cellular automata, uh, of, of termites who leave a trace, um, they can also interact by their leftovers and so on. So this has to be done in general for um, for, for agent-based modeling. Um, what my group 
would suggest for you as a test case for if you can describe things correctly. What would you do with this simple model here? We saw I mean, a simulation uh, of this intoxication. I would suggest just a monolayer uh, of, of cells without any structures in between. Only in the middle there is a central source of, of something that's called a central vein, in which you first put in a toxin. The things die off, so you have the, the cell depth already covered. Then due to uh, the, the lower pressure, the things divide, so you can uh, put some uh, the um, central vein into the role of a, of a source of, of a growth factor, so that this influences and you have another interaction covered with that. And then uh, we would like to see what the description language people will come up to describe this problem. And with this, I would end my talk. So cellular pots, you know, the, the, uh, the transition or the, the growth of the cells, they have to follow a very artificial kind of potential function and so on. And we want to see if we have captured the physical, uh, physical nature of the problem. So with cellular pots, you, you can simulate how it grows and so on. But have you captured the physical things in the problem? Have you understood the problem? I did. Um, they have done some work on creating sort of a high level language that mm -hmm. was trying to say. Uh, uh, you mean CBMSL or CORD? That's yeah, actually, uh, yes. uh, two years ago, there was a, a workshop on um, CBFML. Or what, what's it called? You were there? CBMSL, Behavior Model Specification Language. Um, uh, uh, James Glazier was there and so on, and uh, I have not heard anything uh, since then. So it would be an opportunity for mm -hmm. you to capture another area of biological description. Uh, what is this? Uh, in the in the video, you showed that there's yeah, this is just actually there are uh, things on top, so it's just a cutoff. Um, yeah, if you want to see it again, yeah, that's a nice thing of the talk. <laughs> the network in this case is fixed. Yeah, but we're working on a flexible um, trying to solve the network. Uh, it, it is kind of, yeah, it is, I mean, you have the interactions defined. We, we are working actually on, on a more complicated cell surface model, triangular cells, and we, we're trying to use that kind of triangulation for description of this kind of sort of network. I mean, do you already have a, a representation of what's known in the sense that if you take the reference oh, yes. Yes. as a well, okay, and how do you measure that the cells are in the normal range? Say the levels of protein that they are secreting, the degree of division that they are undergoing. I, the reason why I ask yes. is that it's a useful baseline then to use as an index for any kind of stress you might apply to your system. Yes, that would be a parameterization of it. So if yes. you, you look at uh, what parameters uh, are, are tweaked, how to, to look 
How, how, how would you define stress unless you have the case Yes, of like course. So you have to put that into a model. In right. Into the model. And what do you put the moment? And the model moment, so for the top intoxication, for instance, we just uh, use a, a certain level from which a button uh, threshold yeah, and that was of, of, of this toxin that arrives at the cell. We, we take a, a threshold with a certain uh, probability of it dies off. Sure, but in a sense, rather than using the toxin as a measure of its own toxicity, which can be a bit of preparation, that we is there an independent in index of stress caused by any agent that would reflect changes in what's typically the normal output? For instance, for a set of factors. That would be worked for different uh, models, for models of single cells or experimentation. Right. We, yeah, we don't have that. Okay, because then uh, if you don't have that, mm -hmm. uh, then it would be difficult for you to compare the effects of different dogs. Yes. Because yeah, there, there might be some dogs that might have uh, uh, but there might be different doctors that act by the two. Sure. I mean, uh, if, if we have a certain uh, toxin metabolization network, yes. uh, if we have that, we would be able to put that in the model. So, yes. And then we calculate uh, the concentration that actually kills the cell. Well, so in this case, for instance, you have probably just a floor. But, you know, food poisoning from food from media and after toxin. Yes. And of course, there's no end from a pharmaceutical perspective. What kind of capacity you get? Sure. Alcohol is, of course. I have. So, it's it would be interesting to have alcohol. a profile of the impact of these different toxins from a standard reference for the your indices of health of the liver and use that, integrate that into your model. Possibly. Yeah, but of course, the. So it's not desirable requirements yeah. for the yeah. easiest thing to do. It's not our requirement. Right. Okay. Thank you. So let's, let's move on. The next talk is from uh, Randall Burton, who is the new updates on uh, All right, so hi everyone, I'm Randall Britton from the Auckland Bioengineering Institute. Uh, one of the projects that I work on is FieldML, along with um, some important collaborators. So um, everything I say is, is not just my own work, but really a lot of work for all these people, and they're also to blame. So, <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, why we talk about FieldML at a cell level workshop, um, there are some similarities. Um, we put some effort into using the same model repository as in the PMR, the physio model repository. We aim to use similar annotation technologies and the ability hopefully one day to be able to compose models by annotation. Um, we've already got a, a multi-physics, multi-scale simulation project called OpenSEMIS which uses CellML and to a degree CellML at the moment and in the future. Um, you know, Projects like that will use both. Um, there's some overlap of the goals, and I think in the years to come there'll probably be some kind of a merger of the two standards. Um, at least um, I think sooner than that there'll be some need for some kind of interoperability, maybe. For example, um, a CellML model using some of the data that comes from the FieldML model. Um, so, so those are just some ideas that have been floating around. And, um, because a lot of the people involved in the film mill project have been um, quite heavily involved in the cell mill project as well, there's, there's quite a lot of common approaches, and I think it would be there anyway, um, even if it weren't for the same uh, people being involved. So, field mill fits into the scheme of things by basically incorporating the spatial variation. So, cell mill models typically usually vary um, with according to time. They're time varying models, but they're also known as lumped parameter models. You could think of whatever it is you model with a cell model, whatever quantities, concentrations, or temperatures, and so on, um, are 
identical at all points in space, or equivalently, you could just think of it as modeling as an infinite space. In space. Whereas field ML, to put it simply, takes into account um, quantities that vary spatially and um, vary with time. So spatial temporal model. But really, um, the approach that we've tried to take is to um, in incorporate um, in the multivariate change. Um, coming back to Salomel, you actually don't have to treat the thing that a Salomel varies with as time. You can treat it as, um, as any independent variable. So if you had some model that, that only varied according to one independent variable, it could even be a spatial variable, you could actually use that as a To flip that around in, in field ML, the goal is um, to be able to really just have any kind of multivariate variation. Uh, variation. So, um, our current focus is is very much on uh, um, let's just say fields that you already know, um, as opposed to trying to specify the equations which you still have to solve in order to find fields. It's, it's a bit of a fuzzy definition, but I think it'll suffice to convey what we're talking about. So, a few pictures that convey what we're talking about. The obvious ones are. Um, Ge geometrical fields, um, which define the shape or anatomy of objects in, in um, biomedical modeling. Um, the, the heart model in the middle there, biventricular heart model, includes information about the, um, the muscle sheets and muscle fiber orientation. So essentially the way I think of it is as a, a rotation field that varies spatially. In other words, at each point in space, um, you have an object that represents a rotation of an orthogonal um, coordinate system. Um, the object on the left there, just really trying to show you that some that, that color variation there represents some scalar, say it was um, pressure or some measure of stress, um, so scalar variation. In the top right there is again another, um, it's, it's again just a rotation field, but it's, it's using a novel approach to interpolating rotation. So. The sort of goals and requirements are quite key to defining what we're trying to achieve with field ML. Um, firstly, our target audience is bioengineering. There's nothing in our approach. Well, we're trying to avoid taking approaches that lock us into that audience, but at the same time, trying to balance making sure that what we do is accessible to that audience. Um, so potentially, field ML, like cell ML, could be used more widely than just um, its primary application area. As I, as I mentioned before, our aim is to have it used in multi-physics, multi-scale simulations, um, really to represent models. And by models, I mean two things. Um, the, a, a, a computer um, representation of an anatomy for which you know everything, really. Um, you've, you've approximated um, using interpolation and so on. So that's, what you've done there is you've modeled the anatomy. Um, it's not quite the same as a model where you still have to do Solving of potential <coughs> equations and so on. So there's sort of two separate different meanings of the model, and I mean both of them when I talk about a field in that model. Um, another key thing about what we're trying to do here is we're focusing on field ML as a serialization. So it's not a programming language. It's not um, something that keeps on changing the values of variables. If you have a field ML file, um, you shouldn't have to process it in sequence from top to bottom if there are sort of independent things. Um, very much like a CellML model or any mathematical model, you're really making a whole lot of assertions of statements that hold and independent of the order that you make them. Of course, there some, are some aspects of any grammar that are order dependent. But again, we call that um, using a character style. Um, of course, what's very important to us in bioengineering because of the scale of models we're using and the, the complexity of the models that we're using is that we have to be able to um, implement um, field ML models efficiently. Um, so if, if a solving system is actually using field ML to do output or to the input, it has to be able to process that field ML model efficiently. Um, and we're talking about quite a wide range of um, environments where you're trying to execute um, things that are based on your field ML model. So everything ranging from high performance computing, distributed memory environments, all the way to still being able to use field ML on a desktop computer. Um, the the goal is to um, have the contents of a field ML model really describe pretty much everything that you need um, to interpret that model and not rely on always referring to some external specification. Um, again, I'll talk a little bit about which of these goals we've actually achieved and which ones are still um, things that we're trying to achieve. 
it should be future proof. So we're, we're you know we're thinking very hard when we put something into the design about what kind of um, demands will be placed on something like this in the future. Of course, that's impossible to truly achieve, but it's um, important to think about. Simplicity is quite important. You know, there's not creating a language with such a complex syntax that um, that it really takes ages to write a software implementation to process that syntax. We want to be able to support metadata annotations so that, for example, in an anatomical model, you can quite easily find something in the field ML model to put your annotations against. Um, and um, reusable models, very much like CellML, where you can actually um, you know, have people create libraries of models that you then use in your model. So um, initially, our focus is finite, the finite element method. Um, so what we have so far is essentially the ability to represent um, quite a wide range of um, different interpolation methods. Um, a fair degree of different element shapes, nowhere near as wide as we'd really like, same for interpolation options. And um, uh, our goal is to support a wide variety of coordinate systems at the moment. Um, support for coordinate systems is very limited. So, so I've already jumped ahead a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about, um, about why what we have now falls so, so far short of all these goals. So basically, a key aspect of Field ML is that we, um, a big part of it was funded by a European Commission project called EU Heart. Um, it set specific deadlines by which we actually needed to produce a version of Field ML. So, um, we had to be pragmatic and basically do what's called a scope reduction exercise. And what that meant, we initially, like I said, eliminated um, or deferred, if you like, um, the representation of, for example, partial differential equations in field enough. And focused just on um, things that have a, a known algebraic representation, so pretty much a known field, um, not a field that you're still aiming to solve. And um, so, so the use case that we're aiming for for there is pretty much, you have a field ML model that represents the anatomy or the geometry on which you're going to solve. You read that into some kind of code that's going to do the solution. It does its own internal um, solving. It um, serializes solution fields out to field ML. Um, those can then get read in by visualization software and visualize. And in fact, um, this picture has ended up on the wrong side. So on the bottom right over there um, is an example where that exactly that was done. The, the geometry that we did wasn't all that exciting. It was that rectangular plane. Um, the solution field is based on a, um, a fluid diffusion problem. And um, I think that's a pressure field or something that's been rendered um, very in color. And that was actually, um, so field mail read in by OpenSEMIS and was um, um, solved the solution field written up by OpenSEMIS and then written by CMPE. Um, so the um, the other thing that we've done is we've focused just on creating a file to represent the field ML model, as opposed to when you when you talk about serializing data, you can actually serialize the data and then send it straight into another application, which reads it straight into memory. And of course, what that means is that you're creating a communication protocol between two applications. And again, that's something that we prefer for the time being, but it's very much. Um, been in our thinking. Um, so, um, yeah, FieldML actually, um, the first XML version of FieldML was, was around as much as about 10 years ago. Um, the uh, CellML, the PMR was only used for CellML. And um, during the EU Heart project, we actually released uh, versions 2, 3, 4, and 5, or 0 points, all of those. Um, did the demonstration I described to you and actually added features to the PMR <coughs> that um, allow us to work with field ML, basically allows for interactive visualization of field ML models. Um, so what is field ML 0.5? Um, it uses XML for its serialization. It um, also comes bundled with an API, which is a, a very important lesson we learned from CellML. If you describe the specification of your format, um, of detail, people will also will, will always come up with misinterpretations of it. Um, whereas if you provide software that does a lot of that processing for you, you mitigate a lot of that. Um, that, that API is available from a range of languages. Essentially, the idea is that um, a 
the, the Excel 0.5 model consists of evaluators, and each evaluator um, takes some input, numerical input, does some processing on it, and results in some numerical output. And the field ML file itself doesn't actually do that, it just represents that the software should do that. Okay? And uh, these evaluators get connected up one after the other um, so that the data basically flows through a pipeline, and that's how you define your fields. So essentially, building up more complex fields from very small subunits. Um, I, I'll, I'm happy to go into the details of the format with, with people if you want, but I, I didn't think that was really what was warranted at this talk, so I'll, I'll keep it quite light in that regard. Um, it actually uses imports very similar to CellML, so that one field ML file can refer to multiple other um, field ML files. Um, something that um, we introduced in one of the more recent versions, I think it was just prior to uh, version 0 0.5, was the idea of using um, data sources external to the file, which allows us to use XML, which is you know text you can read in a text editor. Um, external data sources could be in other formats, for example, HDF5 or, or more efficient um, data formats. And in theory, that's allowed for parallel I/O. That's something that we haven't really proven yet, but we've just scratched the surface of. Um, one key, I guess, trick slash limitation of FieldML 0.5 is that it relies on external evaluators. So what that means is that unlike CellML, where you actually use MathML to actually spell out exactly what the algebraic form for some um, function is, um, in in field ML 0.5, you have to go read some documents somewhere that, that describes what that is, and then it will have a, a URL that describes how you refer to that process, and that's called an external evaluator. So what that allows us to do is to actually have small pieces of algebra that um, that are hard-coded into the specification that we can use um, without us having to add to the field ML 0.5 system um, that support for math and math. And uh, another key thing that we've taken a lot of things that most people would use, a lot of building blocks, and actually created what we call the standard library for FieldML 0.5. So it is really just another FieldML file, but almost everything it contains are external evaluations that describe, for example, the algebra for a finite element method um, interpolation basis function. Um, so one of the things about um, processing field analysis is that um, because the actual field ML file uses external data, you can actually put very heavy, uh, you know, the, the sort of gigabytes of numerical data that describe the degrees of freedom and all the values that, that define your mesh in what we call a heavy data section. Um, and that allows you to have a light data section which really describes all the meaning and interpretation of bulk numerical data. Um, so the strategy of achieving high throughput um, when processing data like this is that the application uses the field ML API to process the live data for it, so that it doesn't have to work through all the complex grammar and meaning of the bulk algebra in here. Um, and once it's once the meaning of the bulk data has been communicated back to the application, the idea is then to use a higher throughput channel rather than having to divert everything through the API. Um, to basically read and write the data, hopefully um, the layout of the data and the heavy data on disk matches quite closely the way you want it in memory in the application. Um, and field mill should give um, uh, flexibility to allow you to actually achieve that, um, that closeness. So a lot of work, um, field mill different type has been around for um, I think around about a year by now. It's actually um, pre-release versions of it were around quite a few months before that as well. Um, so since then, most of the work has gone into trying to remove a lot of the limita limitations I've discussed. So actually, Andrew's going to talk about some of those ideas um, in his talk as well. Um, so I'll just briefly skim over this. So, so really, what we what we come up with is some fundamental building blocks built into the language, which would be what we call domains, which represent mathematical sets. Um, real numbers, integers, um, ways of constructing domains from other domains, again using just standard mathematical set operations such as Cartesian products, um, taking a subset, taking what's called a disjoint union, and very importantly, um, connecting um, things together. So if you've got, for example, one biological model of the aorta and you've got a biological model of um, the whole part, 
um, you could connect those two up and at a much simpler level if you've got two finite elements and you want to show that they are actually um, connected. Um, and um, there's quite a lot of mathematical detail about exactly what it means to connect things and um, that becomes quite important when you're trying to talk about the continuity of mathematical fields. So, so some work in progress has already been made on those ideas and some work is still being done. Um, but nevertheless, what we've actually done is produce prototypes that have allowed us to explore a lot of these ideas. These, these prototypes don't mean that this is where the design is going. Essentially, one of the things that we've done all through the project, which has been really useful, is that we've, um, we've actually tried to take design proposals and actually get, um, get them working in a very lightweight fashion so that we don't actually do a full implementation of the proposal, um, but we can actually have um, something that's rigorously defined um, and actually testable to, to test out the ideas. So, 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 so some prototyping has actually been done to actually prove and um, kind of flex these these ideas. And of course, very importantly, is the ability to actually include what we've left out and fill them out up until 0.5, and that is um, algebra, um, the equivalent of what we eventually be serialized in. So, so what we've been able to achieve using those prototypes um, arbitrary, reasonably arbitrary definition of um, tensor product basis functions. Um, Fieldml 0.5 has in its library just some pre-packaged ones. Um, the, um, so pretty much um, the, most of the cases in, in finite element models we've, we've shown that we can represent. There are, there's still quite a lot of debates about um, how efficient those representations are. And so you know, quite a lot of, um, of of the approaches that we think might work to address that were described a few slides ago. Some other aspects to that are a technique called um, pattern matching, whereby if you, you see a more complicated algebraic structure, you can actually summarize that on behalf of the application and then present to the application um, a far simpler concept. Um, so just ask me about it if you want more detail on that. And um, arbitrary coordinate systems, prolate spheroidal coordinate systems, um, uncertainty or stochasticity in fields. So um, what I've got on the bottom there is from Jessica Jaws thesis whereby she had a um, probability distribution of a um, unit vector, really, a direction in space. Um, so basically, what we managed to prototype is a way that you could produce that, so that that probability field or the probability distribution actually itself varies spatially. So, so, so I think that uh, according to the ideas we've got in the prototype, we could represent something like that. That becomes quite useful in in more general statistical models, like statistical shape models, such as the kinds you get from principal components <coughs> analysis. And again, I think uh, although we haven't actually mocked, created a mock-up of this, I think we've actually shown that we can do this. Um, hierarchical mesh refinement. Some issues that we haven't quite, well, that just need probably more work. It's just the ideas on the previous slide are things that I think we've virtually proven we can do in prototypes. Um, so, um, just trivial differential operators, such as in taking the, you know, a full derivative or a partial derivative, something that you can already do in cell ML, um, is something that should be quite easy to do in field ML. A coordinate free or coordinate independent. Um, Ways of expressing differential operators is something that we think we'd be able to do, um, but it needs more work. Um, the um, communication of this new manifold structure when um, connecting different um, parts of a model together. So if you've got two parts and you're joining them together and you want to say things that about um, how they how well they line up geometrically, um, is what that's about. So there's different approaches that have been taken to try and get there. The textbook approach is to use transition functions. Um, so that's the textbook definition of a smooth manifold, but there are other equivalent approaches. And really what we're looking for, I think, is some way where we can actually capture whichever approach is most appropriate for a given model. Um, and yeah, just finally to mention, I think Tommy mentioned this earlier, that um, there are already um, I think two or three Field ML 0.5 models up in the model repository. So it's, it is actually a workable system. We recently had a look at, at another model repository that's um, used heart and almost every 
model in their repository was able to be represented in Fieldbin or 0 0.5. So despite all these um, limitations, it actually still has quite a lot of coverage already, which um, which really just goes to show there's, there's, there's a lot of edge cases that don't make up the bulk of the models that, that people are using. And, um, yeah, finally, just to acknowledge funding from EU Heart, the Bioengineering Institute itself, and Paul has been funded by the Royal Society of New Zealand. So, thanks everyone. Well, so, so basically, um, what field mill 0.5 allows you to do is to, in the field mill file, refer to an external evaluator. And that's um, essentially just a string. Okay. And, and well, so, so then um, what that means is that two pieces of software can't, um, would, would basically have to implement it independently and, and go refer to some specification, something that they've agreed on. Yeah. Well, we quite early on, we had to try and work out exactly how we were going to meet the delivery dates uh, and come up with something that could be used. So, the so, future, not Absolutely. Can you represent a planet bound Um so in field mill 0.5, um, you have um, a, a standard library, but that itself is just a field mill 0 0.5 file. So um, it, and it's essentially full of external evaluators. So if you wanted to do that, you would probably um, you would probably create kind of a library for that. Um, you know, with whatever algebra, etc. Um, so shapes in field ML 0.5 are actually described by means of the field. Um, so, that, so, so you can actually just add an external evaluator for a, a field that represents, well, if you want more detail, it represents the, the predicate of, um, that you would use in the um, constructor for a subset. Um, so it's just a Boolean valued field. And you just create an external evaluator and that represents um, any arbitrary shape that you want. Um, and and so yeah, you know, I, th I think you could, but um, just a lot of time. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you, so yeah, I'm pretty sure you could. Yeah, and certainly I think going forward with, depending how far we get with these ideas that we think are, are going to be the next version of the map, you'd be able to. Do it. Yeah. Any uh, thoughts about representing randomness or uncertainty? Like you know that computers inside someone can have a or what represents a field? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that um, came up over. Yeah, so I was talking about that over here. Um, so pretty much, um, if, if a field can um, take on a value, and that value, um, say, is a real number, um, then just a normal probability distribution would, would communicate the, the uncertainty. If that value represented a location somewhere on a two-sphere, then a latitude and longitude would be sufficient. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly what this example has. So basically an XYZ coordinate, um, and you'd, you'd essentially just create a mathematical probability distribution.
build a sophisticated yeah, system for representing mathematical models. Yeah. So I'm going to yeah, not talk about any specific language that already exists, yeah, such as yeah, Unicode, yeah, but the context that I talked about today yeah, have been implemented in the prototype, which yeah, is going to be put forward as a potential yeah, future direction for field ML. Yeah, some of the contexts might not um, become part of the field ML. Um, some of them are uh, sort of in, still in the idea stage. Yeah, but it, it sort of has some of the ideas that you can take from type theory and apply to representing mathematical models. Yeah. So yeah, just to briefly explain what type theory is and where it comes from. So type theory um, is really a branch of computer science. Yeah, and it, it describes how to deal with um, the concept of a type, where a type and yeah, if you think about a programming language, it's yeah, essentially a collection of attributes that an object can have. Yeah. So some of the terminology that I'm using in this presentation yeah, is taken from type theory. Yeah. But in some cases, because we we're applying concepts from type theory to something new, the concepts didn't already yeah, exist, or the terminology didn't already exist, so I've had to make up some of the terminology that's used here as well. Yeah. So the basic idea between in type theory is that objects have a type. Um, so type and then type is then a collection of information about the properties of that object. Um, so more than one object can um, have the same type, but in the majority of type systems, each object will only have one type. Um, and if you need to have more information, you just yeah, encompass that in the one type that an object has. Yeah. So then there's um, essentially losing yeah. So and yeah, there's several different types. Yeah, of type systems. So I'll, I'll just explain some of the terminology that's used to differentiate between different type systems, which I'll be using later on. The so one is the concept or the di dichotomy between a, a static type system and a dynamic type system. So many of you will have encountered this um, if you have done any um, programming. Um, so what a static type? Um, so it's, um, static typing means that there's a, um, two phases: there's a compilation phase and a run phase, and um, at this, at the, by the time the compilation phase is finished, you know what the types are of everything is. Um, in a dynamic typing system, you don't know until runtime when code um, for your model is actually running. Yeah. You don't know until that stage what the type of objects are. So that's the difference between um, static and dynamic typing. So the benefit of static, or the benefit of dynamic typing is that you can sometimes get slightly more powerful type systems yeah, because you don't need to be able to get everything in advance. But the benefit of um, static typing is that you can you can actually start to erase all the type information by the time that you get to the compile stage. So you start off at compile time, you have your objects, you can work out what the types are, then you can actually throw away that type information when it comes to runtime information. And it's no longer longer a burden on the performance of your program yeah, model. Um, and the other advantage is that the compiler can actually generate code that's optimized specifically for yeah, the type of object that you have. So for example, an integer might be able to be represented by a register on it yeah, very efficiently. So you can actually write a compiler that uses that type of information to make your program more yeah, mathematical model solver more efficient. Yeah. 
So the other uh, important uh, dichotomy to talk about is what we were just talking about static versus dy dynamic uh, is sick versus weak type. So in a strict typing system, uh, the fundamental point is that the, the compiler or the, the runtime system will actually check the type and give you an error if the types don't match up with what you're expecting. So say, for example, you're trying to add two things yeah, and the addition operator is sitting in yeah, a number and you try and add yeah, something that's not a number, you actually get an error. Yeah, in a weak typing system, instead of getting an error, the compiler or the runtime system, depending on the statics or dynamic, will check and, get, and try and do a conversion for you. Yeah. And so the types of type systems that I'll be talking about today yeah, are yeah, static and they are script. Yeah. The reason that the benefit of having a script typing system yeah, with these errors is that the errors can actually help you yeah, prove certain aspects of your program and actually fail yeah, if there's something wrong with your model. So it gives you more confidence that your model is correct. Yeah, so yeah, now we're going to talk about um, type safety. So, so I just talked about how in a strict typing system you can get errors if there's something wrong with your model. And so this um, property is called type safety because the type system is giving you um, a degree of confidence or safety that a model that does compile um, correct, that does compile um, is correct. Obviously, you can get things to pass the type safety and still be incorrect, but it, it gives you additional confidence. And so just to give an example of um, where type safety comes in with, um, imagine that you start up with a type um, that represents any real number, so like 5 or 3.2 or any other um, real number um, can have, an object object can have a type real number. Um, but the thing is, there's more than, um, you can start adding more information to your type system. So, for example, uh, consider uh, adding units into your type. So, for example, you might have three meters being one thing and uh, or one second being another thing. Yeah. So that's there. But then you can go even further than that, and you can actually start to encompass, start to include in the typing system information about uh, the interpretation of values beyond just the units. So, for example. Uh, suppose you have this, yeah, this, this sort of idea that here is using something in 3D space. You can actually have different types representing the point on this axis and the point on this axis, and then maybe another one representing the type. And then um, what you can do is that you can ask if you make these different types, and that means that it's no longer valid, you just directly go and compare um, one and the position on the x axis and say um, one meter on the x axis and one meter on the type. You can't do that. Compiler will give you an error because they're different types. Yeah, so that's yeah, where you get that's an example of yeah, where you get type safety. And if, however, you really do have some good reason to compare your one meter or your one second, there are, and you can do what's called a task and actually include some code that you can just force that to happen. Yeah. But if you did that, it, it would look really dodgy in your model, and, and so a reviewer would go in and ask you why you're doing it. So at least you've signaled that you're doing something unusual to do. Yeah. So there's yeah, several different types of things that you might like to capture in a hypothetical <coughs> language like field of Yeah. One is actual yeah, an actual physical model of something that's actually, actually happening in physics. So, for example, you might want to represent something that's happening in Newtonian physics, um, where you can um, represent any point in time and space, or you might want to say represent a point on a um, on a mesh, which is an approximation of um, the three D space representing a heart, for example. Um, but um, the problem is there's actually not a, a clear line between what's an approximation of something and what's actually yeah, uh, true physical representation. Yeah, so, for example, your model in Newtonian physics might, to a, um, to a modern theoretical physicist, only be an approximation. Anyway, yeah. And so, really, because there's no clear line between where what's an approximation 
and what's yeah, uh, a true physical representation. Yeah, it's actually quite useful to just have one language that can represent the whole continuum of such, yeah, the whole continuum between representing approximate values and representing yeah, exact physical spaces. And so, yeah, and that's really what, it, yeah, and so what, that's one benefit of having a type system. Because when you have a type system, you can start to define all these structures that represent things like approximates yeah, as one type and then yeah, real physical things in another type. And, then, and you can start to talk about them both in the same model. Yeah. So to be able to sort of uh, more complex types from a, a, a simpler models, um, what you really need is some way of combining or um, of constructing new types based on existing types. Yeah. And so yeah, I've called these type constructors. Yeah, so that's a, that's a standard term that I'm yeah, to borrow here yeah, you know, to use it. And so the first thing I'll introduce is what is, is, is a clone. So what a clone does is it takes an existing domain, but it makes, an, yeah, it makes a new domain that has the same structure. Yeah, and so it's structurally the same, but it has a different type. So you've, you've already seen yeah, an example of a clone before where I was taking real and making real in meters. I was making real on the x-axis. So that's really what a clone is doing. Yeah. So, so a position in real on an, e on an infinite x-axis has the same structure as a, a real number, but you want it to be a different type for the purposes of yeah, type comparison. So that's what clone does. Yeah. The next constructor I'll introduce is yeah, a Cartesian product. Yeah. So the idea of a Cartesian product is that yeah, you have multiple axes and you want to essentially make a point that where to specify a point in the um, product domain, you have to specify a point in all of the um, component domains that you've made it up. So an example here is this 3D space here. So to represent this point here in this 3D space, we have to say, where are you on the x-axis, which in this case is at um, point 3, where are you on the y-axis? And so to represent that, you have to specify both points that's a cohesion product um, domain, and you can build that out of the domain for a position on the and a position on the line. Yeah. So there are several ways of um, doing a Cartesian product. Traditionally, in this, um, the, the order of the factors in your Cartesian product is what's important. And, but in, in the notation I'm using here, I'm actually using labels to represent it. The order is, in it, is not important, it's actually the labels that matter. But either way, they're relatively equivalent. And if you do want to go back to the order of the you just use numbers as your name. Yeah. So this, is actually, this form here is actually short for um, domain x, maybe or type x, maybe with x, time, time, y, and then also y. Yeah, so the next thing I'll um, move on to is the disjoint union. Actually, I did just say one more thing. Sorry about that. Uh, so, um, so this thing here, which is basically a product of nothing, it's just used as, an, um, as a special um, Case. Yeah. So a product of nothing basically has just one point in it. And that's sometimes useful if you want to clone a domain that only has one point in it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, now I'll come on to a disjoint union. So previously when we had was a product where you know, to specify a point on a type, you had to say a point on both of the two parts. But sometimes you have things which are structured a bit differently where you want to be able to say a point that's on either of them. So, for example, instead of having two um, parallel or two orthogonal axes, x and y, suppose you have two axes and you want to be able to specify a point that's on either the x axis or the y axis, instead of being on a point across. So, we're putting that a, a disjoint be on um, one or the other of the um, types or domains that we made up. So, for example, x equals 5, y equals 5, or y you know, all three different points. Yeah, of the union domain of x and y. Yeah. So these sorts of things sometimes can come up if you say got oh, yeah, multiple yeah, organs around and you want a point that could be on either of them. So say you've got a heart and a lung, you want to say a point that's either somewhere on the heart or somewhere on the lung. That's sort of that sort of fits into the disjoint union yeah, concept.
if you find that this red thing and blue, you know, and primary color, yeah, could be the edges to any of the red yeah, the label red, but then it's the main that only got a single point in it, green, a green, single point, blue, a single point. So that's basically just an alternative way of representing the same thing. Yeah. Or a, a categorical data. Yeah, of course, Boolean is another example which you've already seen where it can be true or false. Uh, so there's, only, there's now one final type of constructor um, mention, which is the constructor for um, function spaces. So function spaces represent all the possible mappings from uh, a domain, which is one of the arrows of the code domain. So just to give an example of um, a finite sized space, uh, function space, um, consider the mapping from Boolean on and There's actually only four possible yeah, members in this space, yeah, which are the one that will map true, will, will map any input onto true, will map any input onto false, and yeah, will map any input onto the same thing as the output, and will map any input onto the opposite. Yeah, so these are represented by the, the black arrows, the red arrows, the green arrows, and the blue arrows, respectively. Yeah. Um, however, so this this is an example of which is based on only is a small sum, but many function spaces are in fact yeah, infinite in size, yeah, or very large. Yeah. So for example, uh, we have a, a color, if, if you've defined you know, color intensity as a kind of real, then you could map your primary color onto a color intensity. Now of course, so that basically means that you're mapping you know, red onto one intensity, green onto one intensity, blue onto another intensity. So that's synonymous with a vector. So function spaces that you represent there. Yeah, Vectors, for example, in this case, and but they can also let you represent a lot more than that. So, for example, suppose that this was a Cartesian product, like it was primary color times primary color, then you'd be representing a matrix, or you could represent sort of arbitrary tenses as well, yeah, as you start to have higher dimensional products here. And in addition, you can represent yeah, yeah, other sort of, so you have an infinite, you can represent spaces where you have an infinite dimensional domain. So, for example, let's say you're representing a spectrum, then you could have a, yeah, a wavelength, and you have a, a function space from the wavelength onto the color intensity, and now you've got a, yeah, a, a space over a continuous domain. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, and one of the things that um, is the most useful thing that people are going to want to do immediately yeah, with something like this is to try and represent their. Yeah, mesh-based finite element models yeah, in something like this. So I'll explain sort of how to do it. So I'm actually going to start from the bottom and work back. Yeah. So I'm going to say, yeah, so, so what you find ultimately want to do is yeah, what I call a connected mesh and you want to be able to define this. Where basically you define a mesh that describes a continuous yeah, space completely <coughs> yeah, connected so there's no points um, for each one of them. That's where you that's where your ultimate goal is to do space like this. Yeah, but the way to then do that is described already is to start is to describe a connected mesh. Remember, so this mesh would be of each of the elements in your mesh, but then you haven't tried to undo it with me. So you use a connect operator to relate this one to this one. Yeah, then you can be able to find the mesh here. Yeah, this is now just a product, it's like a Cartesian product of a series of points. Yeah. A square. So you can define a point using an example, and you can define a square using a Cartesian product of yeah, a y inside the x. You get the x axis and the y axis inside the x axis. That's a very yeah, slow down to the use of yeah, So that's how you go about defining a very simple down to the mesh. Obviously, you could also do a similar thing to the mesh, which is the standard there that you can define. Yeah, so, so you could have done all this with Fiat and 0 0.5, but the next example shows how you can go beyond <coughs> and define yeah, and describe hierarchical measures. So the idea with, the, yeah, with this type of mesh is that you might not have a fixed number of levels of yeah, subdivisions when you've built your mesh. So, so let's say yeah, the first thing you define yeah, divide your space up into 
four equally sized squares, then you might divide divide each of those squares up into that further square and so on. And if you want to then represent a point, can yeah, and ask the number of levels of division, and what you could do is you could define a space that can recursively refer at the same time. So here we define and firstly we define and and the sum we define and which basically just makes each of the four structural and tasks when you define when you just when you divide up your space. Yeah. Then you have to define find a domain that then you can do that in two ways. You can either um, go straight to representing your um, point in x and y coordinates, or you can say that you want to subdivide it further, and say which one of those four squares are in, and recursively refer back into this um, mesh point here. And so if you do that, that means it's a group down. That means you can go down to the higher speed levels. Yeah. So, this example here yeah, shows yeah, how you would yeah, describe this point right here and yeah, using this type of scheme. So, you start off by saying subdivide data complex. So, that says that you're somewhere in this sphere. Yeah. And now, yeah, you go recursively down to the next level, say subdivide to the time you want to go to the bottom next to the square here. Yeah. And then you say, and now I'm in the top right. And then you go finish and say where you are in that top right square. But that allows you to find a hierarchical refinement scheme yeah, without introducing any new problems. Yeah. Okay, so I'll now talk briefly um, about um, type parameters. Yeah. So when you're defining types, it's useful to have some you know, essentially flat spaces when you define that. Type, um, which you can fill in later. Um, because what that allows you to do is have reusable um, types where you don't know, where you define them in the library, but you don't know all the details at the point where you define them in the library. And you can come back later and fill in the details, and fill in the, the parameters that you know. So, yeah, on this graph here, yeah, the names of them are underscored represent type parameters. So, yeah, element ID here represents. Yeah, you don't know the exact type of element ID at the point when you write this definition of what a square mesh is. Yeah. Because you don't know how many elements will be in the mesh that have been linked to it. Yeah. And then likewise, you don't know what the space of your global node is meant to be with that thing. And you've also linked yeah, the reference coordinates for x and y. Yeah. So you can actually define all this you know, in a completely generic way. Yeah. So this is Defining an actual value of the field to define. Yeah. So that's all in the library. But then what you can do is you can actually then make use of and yeah, you've taken from the library and yeah, so you're using yeah, the notation here in the, in the square brackets. They're saying that the element ID is equal to the and yeah, a particular set of element values which have been defined up here. So then you're, you're going at the blank yeah. And so that then allows you to be fine in general and build out the library so you don't know all the details. Yeah. Yeah, so then the next concept I'm going to is they have something called type classes. So this is something that's yeah, used in some functional programming languages such as Pascal. Yeah, it's quite a powerful. Yeah, feature. Yeah. So what a type class is, is it's basically yeah, a set of properties that applies to a group of types. Yeah, so more than just one yeah, type. And so the example here is um, what I'm called yeah, negatable. So negatable is a yeah, property of a set of types. Yeah. And what we're saying is that on anything that's negatable, then you can do this thing again, which will give you another value, another value from this yeah, same type. Yeah. And if you can do that, then you can write general code that will apply to anything yeah, in that type. So you can say define something like double negate. Yeah. And you can also have multi parametric type classes that yeah, take multiple parameters. So here we're defining a can equate, which applies to two types, which would say that yeah, these you can equate yeah, 
type underscore A with type underscore B. Yeah. That's too much. Yeah. Yeah, and then another very useful thing that you can do is get F is to be able to define one of the type as a type function. So what the sort of domain function there. So what that is is that's where you can define a function yeah, in the at the type sequence. So in other words, yeah, here I'm defining sets so, so we define so this is a class of yeah, sets of types underscore A and underscore B where you can yeah where it's possible to multiply underscore A and underscore B. So what you really want to be able to do is give an underscore A and underscore B and be able to refer to the type that you get by modifying those. Yeah, so you define that's where a uh, domain called multiply result is defined. And, and so here yeah, yeah, we've defined an instance. So an instance is where you're actually saying that yeah, to that specific type belong to a type graph. So we define that if you multiply two reals for any units, yeah, and the result is a real. Yeah. And you can use this sort of concept to define things like yeah, vector multiplication and tensor multiplication. Yeah. So yeah, and, and this is my yeah, final slide. So I'm describing how you can also use yeah, type classes to define embedding. So mathematically, what an embedding is is a yeah, is it describes yeah, how you can transform from one yeah, type or one domain into another domain while preserving structure. So yeah, both of these are, are valid embeddings of yeah, this polymer coordinate space in yeah, this yeah, rectangular coordinate space. So you know, what people mean when they're modeling these they want to do an embedding, they actually don't want to, yeah, they don't care that both of these are valid embeddings, they only want it to be one and so, <laughs> this is the embedding that they actually care about. Yeah. And so, type classes are ideal being able to define this type of yeah, embedding relationship between yeah, the host domain, which might be the yeah, reference our teaching. Yeah. Instead, you just have to be able to define a canonical chord and reverse and then define how they define how that embedding actually happens. Yeah. So yeah, well, not everyone yeah, on the screen necessarily yeah, agrees that all of these should be legitimate. All of these people have yeah, contributed to the ideas yeah, that were yeah, presented. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I thought I'd just come this to a uh, new to the seminar workshop, give a little bit of an update on a little bit, sorry, a little bit of background to why we started on this track about developing standards and some of the, the key events of uh, the last 10 years or so in the development of physio project. Um, but I mainly want to concentrate on the last one, which is annotating cell models, because I think the biggest deficiency in cell model at the moment is the lack of annotations for the component variables. And we've got all the people in this room really to make some decisions about how we should be doing the annotation. And I think we need to, by the end of tomorrow, I'd really like, if, if we had a clear plan, and we could begin the process of bringing all the models in the repository up to the same level of annotation that the this female community is um, so, um, 
So just a reminder about why we, the type of modeling that this is really addressing. We want to try and have biophysically based models as much as possible, but remembering there's always a black box or some We've got sort of few standards and we're adopting um, relatively few of the SPML, some of our field now are the only standards in the game for models. Um, there's a lot more need I think for those standards uh, in terms of model. At least the community has got the highest of standards. Um, we value the need adaptation because for a whole lot of reasons, but not least, we want to be able to build models that are multi scale where we can take an existing model, properly annotate it, properly curate it, dump it into a workspace, and based on the annotations, it can connect itself up as you're building more complex models. And with minimal sort of human interaction in that process. And then finally, we need to never lose sight of the fact that I think a lot of these multi scale models are trying to link molecular processes through the organ scale physiology. We have a lot of effort in the model production because there's no way that you want to run the very detailed molecular level models at the whole organ level. You've got to have to understand how to do the math. But that's really a process that comes on top of the framework for handling the models. So the motivation for standards we want um, to check things like consistency of units, uh, physical laws of aid. And all of this is very important when you're trying to embed models into clinical processes or get it here or drugs based on using models. Um, so it's extremely important for all sorts of reasons that the communities build these modeling frameworks on standards and reproducibility. So can someone else be also generate model outputs, which is how our validators that we currently re rely on the publishing process to um, the reviewers of papers to check on the validation in terms of uh, how well the model matches the biological reality. So we're not really addressing that. It's, it's more a process for the journals. And it would make it a lot easier for the journals to do this process if the models submitted to journals were encoded and, and accepted standards and the tools were available for reviewers to check the models. So and then availability is a model encoded in a standard form. Then there's all sorts of other things you want to do on top of that, frame sensitivity, modularity, we're dealing with very, very complex processes, we have to have a modular approach and therefore be able to incorporate modules um, either in terms of multiple spatial scales or what you do like ones. And then, of course, the usability of all these frameworks depends very much on the development of software. And people will be talking about more tomorrow. So here's the history of the development of the Physio project. And in recent years, we've tended to call it the VPH Physio project, where VPH stands for Virtual Physiological Human, just because the Europeans, when they contributed funding to the development of the Physio model, term representing the European effort and the term that's come up in the age. But it really started, I think, in 1997 with the formation of the Physio Committee by the International Union of Physiological Sciences. So that's a committee that I chaired with Sasha Popper from Hopkins for many years, and Andrew McCulloch has just taken over the leadership. Um, so the development of the Selma Field Market in 1998 and I'll talk more in a minute about the origins of that. Um, and then about the same time, the HTML community, which has much more to do with reactions and biochemical processes. Um, whereas I think cell now is always been a bit more of a biophysical um, models. And then in 2003, the NIH, together with a number of other institutes, formed this IMA consortium. Um, that I've raised him now, and that's since then he has been issuing calls and RFPs for physio related um, funding from NIH plus organizing an annual meeting um, that I was trying to get to, which is bringing all the people that have funding through NIH together 
this kind of issues relating to what is coming. In 2006, the European Union began to look at funding development of the physio, and we developed a report called the STEP um, report, which was a strategy for the European physio in the framework six, and then now the framework seven the following campaign. And a whole lot of projects began, including the European Network of Excellence, which is the major source of funding for development. So, um, and then more recently, the, um, the project that Bernard is very involved in, and Paul as well, the uh, leading more project is where the drug companies are getting together to say we need standards, and the European Commission is also funding uh, a legal based drug company. Then, because of the NRE, the Olympic of Excellence, that was a four year project that was um, coming to an end, reformed in 2011, the St. Paul the VPN Institute. So, it's a European virtual institute um, which is on the board, Andrew's on the board, and that's an institute that's and continuing the momentum developed by the network of excellence. So it's a not for profit organisation just to keep the pressure on the European Commission to keep funding and also look for ways of connecting the Australian industry. But it's really becoming a worldwide thing, focused on Europe, but from the US to Japan. The and these are the graphs that have supported the development of cell model. The first one was our involvement with a US company that was called the Physios. Um, and that was really the beginnings of Salomon. And a lot of work was done between Physio and Sciences Group and Auckland in the development of Salomon, led by Paul in terms of the development of the standard. But quite a bit of, um, of the software development actually began with Physio Sciences. And then that lasted for a number of years before it. Or out by another company that's been in the world, and that's sort of brought that to an end. But in some ways, it's a good thing because it means that the Southern Health Project became completely not attached to the commercial open source project. Then, from our point of view, the probably the most important continuation of funding is through the Morris Wilkins Center, which is like New Zealand Government Centre for Research Excellence. Part of the FBI is part of it. And that has been a strong supporter of development of cell now since 2001. And these are the European grants that um, are coming to the end. Network of Excellence Europe, New Heart is finishing. Recorder is one that's led by the also coming to the end. MSB, which is a prestigious thing, very involved in for it. Um, so then you can see a very important field now that's um, also in the and BPH share, which is going on about a year or so ago, and that's um, sharing data and models in a clinical context. So we're involved um, with a fairly small extent now. And then the Innovative Medicines Initiative that I mentioned in the line, which is all around PKP. So, we wrote a paper called the Vision and Strategy for the EPH in 2010, um, and then updated it this year, or well, that, sorry, last year. Um, and that's just been published in Interface Focus in March or February this year. Um, but the, so that represents a sort of summary of where things are up to in terms of the, the European EPH project. Um, but the paper really is a condensed version of a much fuller report, which is available on that. Um, and that's on the GMOE website, there's a link to it. That gives a pretty um, substantial overview of a lot of the developments that have gone on over the last five years. And where it works. But I wanted to mention this project partly because we've got several people from virtual little project here. Um, and it's really one of the major outside of the, or in addition to the, the heart physio project, which is trying to go from molecule to whole organ. 
Maybe the Lumen project is, is extremely important with its ambition to the multi scale model of the world. Um, very much dealing with molecular processes of signaling and catalysm, etc., in the data science. But as you've seen, we've got some of the talk, well, um, particularly Tim's talk today, we link also with tissue level processes, major health models, and then in continuum models. And I'm very keen that as much as possible, we try and help this project by the use of the multi scale capabilities of some of our field and our environments, as well as SPM. Um, and one of the reasons for inviting some of the people from the virtual loop project down here is to explore particularly the development of the agent based model, which in a sense builds on top of my friend the cell model, as an intermediate, intermediate step to the continuum with a lot of problems. Um, but also because we wanted to, um, we've got Clients here from um, Berlin, where we wanted to also look at the very large scale metabolic models that have been developed as part of the project, which I think are a very good model for us to start to think about how Solana and the modularity of Solana can um, take advantage of the work that's been done in the original project and then use that for other Solana. That will be involved in this as well. I think we're, we're keen to try and use that um, insight in the world in the world to um, use it as a basis for thinking about how we deal with libraries and components in the cell models. Um, so the standards are starting with experimental measurements we need. Minimum information standards and my NMIC is a whole variety of standards that are developed by experimentalists to think about how they can code the nation about their experiment that makes it useful for models. Um, the data standards, DICOM, biosignal model, the data Brooks will talk about biosignal design development, and maybe I will talk about that tomorrow. Um, and then there's these various data repositories, physio maintained by the NIH, and that database, which is a kind of standardized Ray Winslow's CDFG. There's a number of things in the repositories, which can make use of these standards and the associated with metadata qualities. Those, need to, those standards need to provide the APIs and their services. And then that enters into the modern world where the testing our solar field um, <coughs> ethics um, standards are applicable. And the model repositories, bio models, and so on. And again, the model of the, lot of the um, challenges here are to do with the metadata and the use of the model. And just to stress the fact that it's really important that we try and modularize and libraries of the files from which you can then create the files. It helps with the reusability of the system. APIs, web services, and then as Andre has talked about, the fact of finding workflows as part of this reproducible um, modeling process is vital in CML or the whole community's coming around Senegal as a, um, a standard for how we describe these work processes. Work processes. Um, so Alan Gandhi is developing the Sahel simulator over the core, which we'll talk about tomorrow, will incorporate Senegal as a way to specify simulation process. Some of them will not be reluctant to use it for all of our computational then the software um, at the larger scale of open core is, is how long we'll talk about it tomorrow for not very much cell phone model. We'd like to extend that to incorporate agent at the moment. Then the open seamless crystal we'll talk about tomorrow. Continuity is Andrew's um Pandela program that's in the area of Chase is the Oxford um, one which also uses the cell model. 
verification benchmarks. Um, I'm not going to talk about those because they're part of all of this. Duration annotation and the idea of a reference description. One has already talked about that. Um, we need to be getting the journals to adopt these standards, and, and that some of them are. And we're slowly making progress in getting the journals more engaged with this whole process so that when the papers are submitted, referees can check by using software to run the models and submit the papers and then when they're published and available. We've got a long way to go, but I think there's quite a lot of interest by the publication community to be able to build on this public effort to make the whole process of model paper the author of the journals much easier. Um, and then no way to talk about this, but this is the higher level commentary on how relevant models are. <coughs> These are the standards, some of those have been on the Incorporation of those APIs into the very software simulation standard and repositories. Okay, so what I want to spend most time on is the annotation part. So we've got OpenCore, which is a flagship program for authoring, curating, annotating, simulating, so on and on. The official release of that will be tomorrow. <laughs> None of us have been using it in, uh, for quite a while now. And, and it's, it's, I, think, um, I think it will be officially released tomorrow. So that brings in models from um, the database, the, the EMR repository, um, and Andre's needed for the use of the um, the workspaces so that you get the full history of imports and provenance, the full hierarchy of imports rather than the provenance of models as part of your workspace. Yeah, the sum of our models can be thought of in two parts. One is the mass, the syntax, and the other is the metadata semantics. And I think we're in good shape in terms of the syntax, but we're in very poor shape in terms of the semantics um, covering mm -hmm. We've got the metadata associated with all those publications that we've got bad enough to start annotating the models. And there is a draft step for the annotations, which my calling is developed. Um, and now I want to just try and talk about how we might go about using that step, using the tools and all the work that's gone on in other places around the development of our policies. So here's the, here's the problem. You've got a variable in your maths which we call one variable is x. We want to state that that variable is actually a calcium concentration in the cytosol. Because if you're going to use that model as part of a bigger model, you're going to combine it with a module, then if the other module happens to call x y, there's no reason I should have to call x, you obviously need the means of making sure that two models are talking about the same quantity. So you've got to annotate. You've got to say, what is X? So let's say X is calcium concentration in the cytosol. And the key points here, and I, I should add a qualifier here that I'm a complete novice in this, um, this ontology annotation area. So please um, correct me who knows a lot more about this. But I thought if I go through this, the level of I can sort of Others are not also in that um, So the point here is that the concentration is a property of an entity which is calcium in the same time. And what you do is to form these things called RDF triples or RDF triples. We have a thing called a triple store, which is a database that contains these. And what a triple is, it's basically three URIs, so three pointers. In one case, it'll be a pointer to X. So X has a um, URI associated with it. Another will be some sort of statement about um, X, which is the composite, if we'll come to a minute, composite URI. And then the thing that joins the subject and object is a predicate or a process 
which in this case is, is a computational component there. So that relation in blue color is specified by the SPML community or SPML satellite communities have come up with a common set of relationship relation um, terms of which that's an example. And that means that we do have a community acceptance of how we reform these um, processes that connect these objects together, connect the X in the, in the model with the URI and the composite annotation sitting in some um, knowledge base. So you can query the triple store with start new queries, and what you want to do is to form these composite annotations. So the composite annotation is, um, is to do with calcium concentration in the cytosol. And each of those terms, calcium concentration in cytosol, will come from different ontologies. So there's a community of um, chemists who think about how the name of the group names about biological entities, calcium. There's a group of people like the gene ontology group who define cell components. So this is just one part of the current setup, but the part that we want to use is the fact that they've got these names for cell components, one of which is cytosol. So we've got we want to refer to the fact that we've got calcium in the cytosol. But now I want to give it a term that represents some physical interpretation or property of that entity. Calcium in cytosol is an entity. Now we need to refer to the fact that it's a concentration of interest in it. And that's a very trivial example. And you can think of lots of other examples if you're referring to pressure. And the blood pressure is a particular property of the entity of blood. And all the way through our modeling process, we're biological terms with biophysical terms. And the biophysical terms are going to come from OPB. So, this is the open physics um, um, intelligence. Um, and that's been developed at the um, University of Washington in Seattle. Um, so, Max Neal, for example, um, is from that group. And they are developing the ability to create these composite annotations that combine the biological processes with the physical processes. So, what you need to be able to do is to access these ontologies that have been in our knowledge base. Um, and the reason for representing them in the knowledge base is that it gives you the means to, to reason over these ontologies. Um, and when you form a new composite, it itself becomes defined by an idea of triple that goes into the store and becomes part of this now knowledge base. That means you have to add these new composites and then you've got to reclassify the whole of the knowledge base. Because, um, so what that means is you're now going to take that to the calcium concentration in cytosol and index it so that when you search, you can find the X in your model so you know that that model is dealing with something that's relevant to the calcium concentration in the cytosol. Therefore, you could pull that model out of the DMR database to incorporate into your workflow general local. So once you form these new composites based on using these ontology, reference ontologies, we've got to be able to put these composites back into here. And what I'm proposing is that what we should, as a community, we should do is to say we've got this tool which um, Max is developing is a model tool from Sarala from here that's working with Vernon in, in uh, the UK. It's also developing tools that can provide the composites from these ontologies. The Samson effort led by Max is um, focusing on, and he'll talk more about this tomorrow, is focusing particularly on the OPP, the aspects of these. Um, so, what seems to me sensible is that these tools are used directly with these our knowledge base represented, for example, in the photo, um, where the composites form completely independently of 
the open core of the bar. So I think we should do that is have the ability to open the core and to annotate and have the, the, the right user interface to um, make use of annotations that come from these ontologies, but not have the burden of conversation instead of that in here. It's better that the people who um, know how to deal with these issues over here are um, using the tools to build the content of annotations. And then all we do is take advantage of it through tools like that. That means that if you come across a situation where such a composite doesn't exist, then you would go to this group and say, please create a composite, stick it into the knowledge base, um, update, reclassify the knowledge base, but then that's available to the modeling community through these tools and that community. I think that would be a nice way of separating problems of using the ontologies from application in the process of creating the concepts. Um, and I've talked to both uh, Max and Vernon and Mel, and I think everyone seems to agree that that might be a nice way of delaying the task here. The point that they all make for because there will be many such combinations uh, of uh, um, entities in the, um, of the you know, various ontologies that uh, you know, may wish to be uh, I mean, if, if there is a flood of uh, um, such concepts that we need to bring it into the ontologies, how are we dealing with the people that are seeing some very good things? It's just a question of when, which tools are used to, are used to create those, those concepts. And what we're saying is that the here of tools, we can use them. So you can have this one running alongside your mapping portal when you need the composite that you use that time to put it in the remote apps. Um, but you don't try and do that when you're in the cloud. And it says, why should we? And you can see that in a situation where I'm sure there's going to be a lot of work in the world's composite. This should be a lot of work in the cloud. less and less. Because of this, as you come from a new situation, you can have a situation that is not true. Every time you, you go through this process of reclassifying, you know, index and you turn know, within the next several hours of Right, I guess the point that's being made here is that. If somebody has created a composite for a concentration of calcium in the site soil, then you don't need to recreate the composite from scratch. You can find it in the knowledge base and reuse it from your own annotation. If that answers part of your question. And I guess Yeah, I you know, I guess my my query was how do you something in the site soil is a you know, just one example of of uh, many, many different uh, combinations uh, that you may or may not wish to uh, sort of put into your knowledge base. But, I mean, if, for instance, you only have a couple of examples of composites, uh, you know, uh, referred to more, not even composites, but uh, composite relationships uh, being, uh, being referred to. Uh, who makes the decision about whether that should be formally put into the uh, into the knowledge base, uh, you know, for further reuse, or whether it is simply a uh, a, a one-off thing that isn't going to be need to be reused? Well, I, I guess this really puts the light on why we bother taking it all. It will have a variable. Uh, that has a specific meaning, and this meaning is not reproduced anywhere else in the repository, then it behoves us to explicitly declare what this variable means and to place this composite in the repository. Because it means that other people looking for resources that concern this variable may find it. Now it's a question of, you know, what's worth finding and what isn't worth finding. That's not what we're trying to address here. We're providing the tools 
to make explicit the meaning of those variables that are worth finding. Uh, besides what is worth. So that then Christian model is stands over the first one. Oh yeah, no, no, I'm yeah, right. I think that the you know that's um independently of our I mean the point being that uh, resources that are annotated that are not annotated are very hard to find. Uh, I think the iteration we so we're trying to have an idea that it's half it's half better, it's it's boring, it's not ready for publication. It might even be totally silly because you're looking for something and there's an up until I throw away my code of colleague or the next one I want to publish it, which they can make it more formal. But while they're messing around, they don't want to make it too public. Uh, yeah, I mean I can see situations too where you when you talk about conservation of something or other and it would happen where that can never happen. So you could form the it's biologically not but that's where the reason is coming to play because you can run the rules over the whole knowledge base which then sorts out which are the old. And that says one also has to bear in mind the sense of community. It says that maybe there is already annotating its resources, its data set. Using set of topologies that we are discussing here now, which means that by annotating modeling resources with the same topology, our search not only helps us find our own resources, but also relevant resources to what we're dealing with, including, of course, data sets. And the former is also true. If somebody is looking for data resources for calculation, the same search will also allow us to find modeling resources. In this case, coming get those annotations from the MRT. And just to follow up with that, even if you know, you've had some totally esoteric <laughs> annotation that you just didn't use once among the hundreds of models that are out there, um, that, that term, because it happens in different ontologies, may you know, help you identify, help, help find uh, that model or related data, um, even though it's just there's only one instance of that term with models. It might be useful. Okay, so that's not the question.